Okay, so I guess the, the general theme of my talks this year is side projects or side effects or uh, accidental stuff, things that I did not origin, originally intended to do. So this is yet another example. Uh, but this time, contrary to the lightning talk, it's uh, related to a project that some of you may have uh, heard of already, which is the QuickRef Decklet project, the aim of which is documenting the, um, the whole QuickLisp world, which has been going on for a while now. But first of all, I would like to start with a short preamble, because uh, after talking to a number of people here and before, the, before ELS started, it occurred to me that maybe the term cohort um, or at least the way that we use it in the French academic system or fr maybe francophone academic system is uh, perhaps a bit specific to that. So if, if, if you look at a random definition from, uh, for what a cohort is online, you will get something like this. A group of individuals having a statistical factor such as age cl or class membership in common in a demographic study. Only cohort for us, um, uh, academics in France, uh, gradually came to mean something different. Uh, the term was, uh, first of all, uh, used in the medical um, uh, field to designate a number of, um, of people. For instance, my, uh, my, uh, my son, when he was born, was part of a so-called cohort the purpose of, of other kids, the purpose of which was to uh, investigate on the effects of uh, urban pollution on the health, for instance. And then from that, uh, and from the medical, uh, and even more generally speaking, the biological ground, it came to also be used in computer science to designate any kind of uh, reasonably large database of any kind of stuff, the purpose of which would be to perform uh, Exper experimental studies in a uh, confined environment or to gain any kind of insights, statistical insights, for instance, on a bunch of data. So this is, the, this is what we call a cohort. And on top of that, it's also important for, for me particularly because when you create a cohort of any kind, it also counts as an academic. Uh, it's, it's good for the CV. Let's say, let's say it like that. So not, not that it's necessarily particularly useful or interesting, but it's good to have that on the CV. So, so that's what a core is. Um, a little bit of history first. So the, the Decklet project, which is my um, reference manual generator for Common Lisp Library, started the project actually uh, started in 2010. At the time, was uh, merely interested in generating reference manuals for my own libraries. Uh, the development went on for uh, um, approximately three years, and then I issued the, the first stable release. And this is the point at which it occurred to me that maybe uh, it would be interesting to document, to automatically generate reference manual for libraries other than mine. And so this is how the, Quick, uh, the QuickRef project started with the help of a former student of mine. So QuickRef uh, started in 2017. At the time, Decklet was at version 2.3. And actually, QuickRef is essentially a wrapper on top of Decklet, which means that it calls the Decklet uh, library on every single uh, ASDF system there is in QuickLisp. And then it aggregates the results and generates a website, which uh, probably many of you have seen already. And so uh, uh, today, the QuickRef website uh, automatically generates reference manuals for more than 2,000 libraries. Every time QuickLisp is uh, a new version of QuickLisp uh, is released, the website is automatically uh, regenerated. Uh, and that's it. Um, so since the beginning of the QuickRef project, there's been a number of pressure points on me, both internal and external. One of them uh, is uh, the fact that um, for different technical reasons, uh, Quick Lisp runs Decklet on ASDF systems, but in separate Lisp images. It's, uh, I think it's actually, the, the, the reasons are actually quite obvious. First of all, it's uh, totally unrealistic to load the whole Quick Lisp world in a single Lisp image. Um, and on top of that, even if uh, I had a, a gigantic m a machine and uh, uh, a powerful processor able to do that stuff, it, it, it would still be impossible because from time to time uh, there are conflicting dependencies between libraries. So you cannot possibly load the whole QuickLisp world uh, in a single Lisp image. Um, 
Also, I mentioned to say that Declet works by introspection. So Declet loads uh, an ASDF system in memory and then introspects, notably with the SB introspect uh, library, the contents of the library in order to generate the documentation. That's why it needs to load everything in memory uh, first. Okay, so it's it's unrealistic to do so. And one of the consequences is that uh, in order to build the, the quick ref author index, I need information, author information from the libraries, but that information is not directly available to quick ref because Declet is run in separate processes. So um, at a certain time, uh, at, a, at a certain point in time, I had to actually patch Declet specifically to extract that information, which of, of course is not really satisfactory. Um, the second pressure point uh, that I uh, feel uh, and I've been feeling that for a number of years now, it's an external one. Originally, and that is actually still the case today, uh, Declet generates reference manuals in the tech info format, which is a, a format which I find, which I like. I've been using it for, for 20 years. And actually, it's a, it's a, a format which is quite well suited to, to reference manuals. Uh, it's an intermediate, it's not human readable, but it's an uh, intermediate format from which you can generate HTML, PDF, and a number of other things. Uh, so this is all good for me, but there are people who would like to use Declet and to have, uh, for instance, a direct uh, generation to HTML. Um, so this is the, this is the QuickRef uh, website, and this is how a, a, a current reference manual for a library looks like. Um, I'm old-fashioned, maybe I'm satisfied with that, but some people do not like, uh, would like some, uh, fancier HTML rendering and stuff like that. Okay, so this is one reason to drop the, not drop, but uh, um, uh, put aside the tech info generation and write another layer which would output uh, direct HTML rendering with uh, maybe a fancier layout or something. So that's the, the second uh, pressure point that I have on my uh, shoulders right now. And because of that, I started to think that maybe um, Declet, which is currently a, monolith, a monolithic engine, or was a monolithic engine, would be better redesigned uh, as a, a multiple stages uh, pipeline. So this is what I've uh, started to do for a number of years now. It, it does not uh, go as fast as I would like it to do, but um, I have other things to do uh, in my time as well. So this is the intended uh, design of the uh, revamped uh, internal architecture. So the idea is to have a three stages pipeline. The first stage, uh, which I call the assessment stage, is a stage at, at which Declet loads uh, an ASDF system into memory and creates by introspection an internal representation of the library with all the programmatic information that you would like to uh, have in the final reference uh, manual. So that information, the, this stage, uh, at this stage, you create, uh, Declet creates a so-called report, which is actually just a, a data structure containing all that information. It's completely disorganized, but uh, it's, uh, it's um, equipped with a, an exhaustive set of cross-references. Okay? The second stage is going to be called the assembly stage. And this stage is going to create uh, an organized data structure and by organize, I mean this is the final organization that you would like to have in the reference manual. Okay, so this is, for instance, the place at which you would like to have all the public information in one chapter and all the private information in another cha chapter, so that a reader of the manual would be interested in only the public interface. It could go, it could go as it is right now to to the chapter containing all the publicly to uh, the exported definitions. Okay, so the purpose is just to organize the all the information. But it's still not; it's still completely uh, format independent. And finally, the the third stage is called the typesetting stage. And at that stage, you take the organized internal representation of the reference manual, and then you generate uh, the final uh, human readable uh, documentation. As of today, <clears throat> which is uh, 4.0 better one, only the first stage of the pipeline is uh, complete. So uh, Declet has a function which is called assess, which creates the report. And the rest, because it's not done uh, yet, it is currently wrapped uh, in a function called, just called Declet-1 out of, uh, for the lack of a more creative uh, terminology. 
Okay, so right now I have the first stage of the pipeline complete, but not the rest. Good consequences already. It's for me much easier to generate the, the uh, quick ref author index, which you have here, for instance. Oh, there is a very prolific author here. It's called unknown. <laughs> But as you can see, all the reference manuals here are organized per uh, author name. So it's obviously much easier for me to generate that index now because instead of calling Declet as a monolithic engine, Quick, uh, QuickRef calls the assessment function first, gets the report, extracts the author information in a single list image, and then just goes on with the rest of the uh, processing. And at that point, that is the point at which I had an idea the first one in a very long time. Uh, I thought, what if we dumped all the reports that, I've, uh, that I'm able to create now for all the quick list libraries, and what if I were to dump all that information in files and use that for something else than documentation purpose? So for instance, to get insight on, uh, I don't know, the morphological shape of uh, Lisp code in the, in the whole quick list world, and, and so on. So I quickly hacked something to, to be able to present a paper at that conference. Uh, and what you essentially get if you do that is a so-called cohort, which currently contains more than half a million programmatic definitions. These are classes, macros, methods, uh, set of expanders, the, the whole bunch of stuff that there is in the whole quick list world right now. Okay, and so this is already, it's, in, it's currently in a, uh, in a beta uh, stage, but this is already available in, uh, on the QuickLisp uh, website. You can click here, the cohort is here, and you can download the cohort as a tarball. And there is also a bunch of examples of uh, statistical analysis uh, charts that, I've, that are also generated automatically every time uh, QuickLisp is uh, upgraded. I'm going to get back to this in a couple of minutes. How much time do I have left? Okay. Uh, what is the, the general shape of a Declet report? So it's essentially uh, a data structure which contains a number of information for, for uh, extracted basically and primarily from the ASDF system definitions. Uh, what is of a, a, a specific interest for us here is the, so the definitions slot here, which contains a list of programmatic definitions abstracted in a, in, in a specific way. So that's where you find the list of um, methods, classes, uh, and, and all that stuff for every ASDF system there is in QuickLisp. Uh, the definitions in question, and this is fully documented in the, in the manual, the definitions are uh, designed in an object-oriented fashion. So you have uh, um, an abstract class which uh, represents all the definitions there is in Declet. You have a sub-hierarchy for ASDF uh, definitions, systems, modules, files, all that stuff. You have obviously a class for package definition. And then there is everything that is named uh, uh, by a symbol. So varoids, uh, classoids, which means uh, structures, conditions, and classes, yeah. funcoids, set affable funcoids, method combination, the whole bunch of stuff. Let's just look at an example. Uh, this is a, def a declet definition for a generic function. So as you can see, you have, uh, where's my uh, mouse, it's here. You have the um, a reference to the method combination. There is no associated set of expander for this uh, generic function. It's not foreign. It means it, it's defining the, uh, the system in question. There is a home package. There is a list of uh, methods in that generic function. The object slot here is the original Lisp object, which is currently represented by that definition. And for us, the important thing here is to notice that every time I have a cross-reference to something, it's not a cross-reference to, to the original Lisp object, but to the Declet definition for that object. So I don't have a list of reference to methods, for instance, here. I have a list of references to definitions for the methods belonging to that generic function. Okay. Uh, currently, what I'm doing, this, this is really preliminary uh, stuff. I, I was actually interested in getting uh, insights on the morphology, as I said, 
um, about the, the uh, statistical insight on the morphology of Lisp code that you can find in Quick Lisp. So what I did instead of doing an actual serious dump, I uh, uh, post-processed the reports from Declet. And so this is just a sample of what you get in the current version of the cohort that you can download. So for instance, you have, uh, so this, this is the Declet system actually. Uh, if you look at this, for instance, you have here a, um, a list representing the definition, the ASDF system definition. So instead of, uh, of dumping the doc string, I'm just currently dumping the length of the doc string. Uh, if you look at uh, the package definition here, I'm, dump I'm not dumping references to external symbols, but just the number of symbols there is. So 169 exported definitions, blah, blah, blah. And the same similar things for classes. Instead of dumping everything, I'm just currently dumping the number of things. So for instance, the class generic function definition has doc string, which is 154 characters long. Uh, there is only one super class, one uh, direct subclass, and 11 methods in that definition. Okay, So that's just what I'm doing right now. It's, it's quite rudimentary, but it uh, allowed me to create a number of interesting statistical uh, diagrams. I'm going to show you just a couple of examples of those, but there is more on uh, 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 some additional ones on the website. So for instance, this is a histogram of, um, of the, the spread of symbol, length, symbol name length in the whole QuickList world. Okay, So the shape of this is probably not very surprising, but what you can get from that uh, histogram is that, as you can see, most symbols in QuickLisp uh, are between 10 and 15 characters long. Uh, by the way, I apologize for the unreadability of the x-axis here, but and I will get back to this later on. As you can see, there is also a symbol which is 135 characters long. Okay, I'm gonna get back to you in a while about this. Okay, so this gives you an interesting insight on how do people name their variables and functions and classes. So, okay, this is the kind of field that I that I wanted to have uh, and which motivated this work. Here's another interesting insight. This, uh, as as a guy fond of documenting and typesetting, I was mostly interested in that actually. This is the average. Uh, this is the sorry the percentage of documented definition sorted by category of programmatic definition. So for instance, you can see from the general shape of this that approximately, roughly speaking, a third of programmatic definitions in the quick list world are actually documented. One definition out of three or four is currently documented. Uh, some, some interesting uh, things here. People seem to disregard documenting the methods as opposed to, for instance, the generic functions. There is not much documentation in slots, uh, much less than in classes, and practically no one is interested in documenting their compiler macro. Okay? So I don't know why. Personally, I'm such a psycho, I document everything, so I'm, I'm, I'm the direct, uh, well, anyway. So, uh, yes? Is that only for external symbols or also ring This is for everything. And of course, the interesting thing is to, to figure out whether the, the shape of this is going to change if you consider only internal stuff or uh, external stuff. And this is, also, this is easy to do, obviously. This is just a 10-liner. I just didn't do it in this presentation. Look at the previous line. Yeah. Can you also put the names of these documents? Yes, I know all the names. <laughs> I, uh, yes, that's, just wait for a second. Okay. <laughs> I have a number of other prizes to distribute today. <laughs> um, where was I? Yes, classoids, that's also uh, quite interesting, I think. Uh, this is the average number of blah, blah, blah you get in classoids. So th this is, these are structures, classes, and conditions. So um, interestingly, uh, the average number of methods per class, and again, both private and public is approximately eight, as you can see. Uh, there is not many slots in average in classes because you have something like in average slightly more than two slots per class in QuickLisp. Uh, the number of average slots in structure seems to be higher, okay? But on the other hand, if you look at the, of course, the, the average number of parents for structures is exactly one because 
you have only single inheritance. But when you look at the, the average number of class uh, of superclass, direct superclasses for classes, you see that it's only slightly above one, which means, which seems to indicate that people do not have much use for multiple inheritance. This is what it tells you. Okay, so that's also yet another example of uh, interesting statistical insight that you can get uh, from that uh, cohort. It's uh, yeah, good question. It's the the average number of uh, methods directly specialized on the class. So what's what you don't see here is, for instance, uh, this is something also interesting. Uh, do you specialize on the first argument? Do you do multiple uh, multiple dispatch a lot? It's not here. It's easy to do. I just you know, but, uh, the, that's the kind of insight that you could get as well. It would be also interesting to know, for instance, how many. Uh, unary methods are specialized on class so that you could extract reader or writer information and maybe get statistical insight for the rest of the functions and not those ones which actually belong to the classes more than to the, exter the external uh, interfaces. Okay, so this was, uh, this was just three typical examples of interesting insight that you can get. And now let's get back to the funny discoveries that I made while doing this work, because uh, there is a number of those. So there is a doc string length record, first of all. So it's for a macro. Uh, the macro, the doc string for the macro is almost 30,000 characters long. I looked at the code because I have the name of the guy who did this. It amounts, it's handwritten, it amounts to 550 lines, and it's actually a complete, a completely handwritten user manual for the library. It's just put directly in the doc string of the macro in question, okay? The macro is called def binary, and it's from the, li uh, the um, list binary uh, library, which uh, apart from that, I never used myself, by Jeremy, F uh, Jeremy Feltz, okay? Uh, yes, yes, a round of applause for Jeremy. <laughs> the famous symbol length, symbol name length record. So it's a function name. It's, as I said before, 135 characters long. Actually, it's not handwritten, this one. The, the symbol name, the, the symbol uh, has been obtained by formatting a format string with a number of arguments and then interning a symbol in some package. Here is the name of the symbol. It, it doesn't fit on the slide. It's semantic checker, not the spaces, four character classes with clauses, blah, 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 blah. 135 characters later, you have to congratulate Michael Ruskin for the Ezrap peg package. Please give Michael a round of applause. And I will stop there, but uh, I could continue for, for two hours, you know. I can continue at the lunch break if you want. Uh, there is also a symbol cardinality length record. So what I call symbol cardinality is, is uh, when you have a symbol named foo dash bar dash baz blah blah blah, you count the number of sub uh, name in the symbol separated by dashes. This is the cardinality, okay? So the record is for a class name. It is 13 components long, including three empty ones, which means that at uh, three times you have two consecutive dashes in the name. Okay? Here it is. It's, it's, sorry, it's handwritten, this one. Here it is. Arc, constraint, tangent, two, dash, dash, center on, dash, dash, through point, dash, dash, select side. Do you recognize it? It's Dave Cooper who's in the audience. It's in the Jendal package. Congratulations, Dave. You have just won a unicorn. It's here. Come get your prize. The other ones were not in the audience, so you only have that. Congratulations. I love your work. Okay, so time to wrap up. Uh, so as I said, the, the cohort is currently more than half a million of programmatic uh, definitions long, so this is quite huge. 
And, and uh, my, my point here was just to show you the kind of interesting insight that you can get from, from that kind of stuff. Uh, everything's already automatically uh, updated on the website, but it's still in beta uh, great because there is something, and I would like your help on this, uh, there is something which is not done yet, which is a serious dump. Uh, actually, as of today, I've never done serialization before, so I, I, I can obviously dig into that and do it myself, but I'm pretty sure that many of you have some experience in that, and if you want to save me uh, some time, I would like, to, I would like uh, someone to point me in the right direction. So doing a serial dump, uh, what do I mean by that? Um, for instance, there is something which I don't need to keep when I'm dumping the reports into files is, is the, the pointers or the references to the original Lisp objects because obviously those ones are long gone by, by then. But what I would like to, to be able to preserve is the cross references between every uh, uh, programmatic definition that I'm dumping. Okay, so I'm sure this has something to do with serialization. I've just never done that before, so please help me. Uh, I'm also uh, ex expecting, I think it's likely that I'm going to encounter some problems, for instance, when dumping lambda lists. Uh, if I dump a lambda list in which there is an EQL specializer on some object, how do I represent that in a file? I don't know, so please help. I would be able to, <clears throat> uh, I, would, I, I would be grateful if you could uh, point me in the right direction. And that is all I have for now. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Anybody questions for CDH method? Yeah, this, this one also maybe. So my question was more related to deco in general. Uh, when you extract uh, doc string information from uh, different objects, you are accounting only for the doc strings, literal doc strings, or also you're trying to uh, catch comments, uh, which may be in different formats? No, uh, comments are not uh, handled right now for the, for the good or for the bad reason that uh, the, uh, everything is extracted by introspection. So I load the library in memory, so the comments are gone, which is unfortunate. But that's the that's the trade-off uh, doing it this way. Yeah, because I assume that there is uh, some a percentage of authors who use this style of annotation. There, there, there is there is some some non-negligible form of documentation in comments. Yes, but what I would prefer is for people to write that uh, in a different way. <laughs> it's uh, I hardly I don't think I will. Yeah, there is something I, I, I intend to do actually is to come up with some, some kind of reader macro which could warp comments. You know, if, if you can open, uh, uh, come up with a syntactic trick to warp comments within reader macros, then you could extract that into strings. You both? Yeah, one time <laughs> on one script. So this kind of uh, Lisp code exegesis is, is kind of fun. Uh, you zoned in immediately on the, the extreme cases. Um, could you see uh, something like a, a code style uh, advisor that would say uh, you're, you're using too many of this or too few of this or watch out you're coding in the style of Dave Cooper, for example? OK, I'm, I'm going to stop you right there. <laughs> If I ever start to write some form of uh, style guide for a uh, Lisp, I'm going to make as many friends as enemies. So, <laughs> actually, I, I have my own coding style. It's private. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, my, uh, as, as a documentation generation package maintainer, I would like you people to write much more documentation for your definitions that you actually do right now. Thank you very much. One more question? Yeah. Uh, just, yeah. Hi, uh, in the social world, we have a very similar project. And I know that some people are attempting to build a graph database of uh, all the programmatic entities and their, their, uh, well, their dependencies across uh, yeah. different libraries. And it's it's have, on my to-do list. Okay. Do you think you can build like optimized task runners once you have these kind of things, or 
like other tools on top of that database since we have uh, I would like uh, I certainly would like to do so yeah okay. it's not done yet first thing is probably to create the uh, dependency graphs I would like to do that for classes also for um, uh, conditions um, restarts I'm not sure that's possible but I, uh, uh, it, it would have to be dynamic so not, it's difficult but the, the simple thing of as you, you saw my lightning talk yesterday so when working with a condition system for instance it's, it's, it's really beneficial to be able to have a visual graph of all the conditions and the hierarchy of the conditions in order to remember the, the error ontology that you have developed in your library and this is definitely on my to-do list here you do realize that we aren't happy about the author attributions as they are right now and we expect you to pass the git commits up to next year thank you very much i hate you so much <laughs> all right yes sir thanks to didier let's have some lunch then thank you